All right, good morning, everybody. Oh, I like it. People are talking back already. That's good. All right, we're excited to get going this morning. It's going to be a short day with some, some more good information, then everybody gets back home to their family and friends. It's been great being here this week. It's been a long week for those of us that came in early. Um, we'll, go, we'll dispense with the AIA pro forma slides here, but making sure you're in the right spot. These are our learning objectives today for our existing building case study. We're glad you joined us. Making sure you're in the right place. We're going to reduce energy by double digits using existing building commissioning without capital expense investments. Sound good? My name's Andy Sharon. I'm on the existing building commissioning team at Smith Seckman Reed. And I'm here today with Victor Sia, who leads our group. Good morning, everybody. Happy Friday. All right, got another good morning. Okay, it's a pretty short agenda. We're gonna keep this short and simple, really. Uh, we're already done with, with a fifth of it, right? Commissioning industry, just got a couple of slides on an overview. Y'all all know this stuff likely, and uh, we'll just touch on it. Gonna talk about a couple of methodologies we blended together that, that, that prove success. And then we're gonna talk about a, a case study that's uh, done real well, and we're proud of it, uh, along with the client. Then we're gonna leave some room for question and answer, so we'll just get going. So, raise your hand if you've been in the industry for five years or less. Everybody get them up. Surely you've been in the industry for five years or less. This is all hands up, hopefully. Who's been in the industry for five to 10 years? 10 to 15, keep them up. Oh, oh my God. <laughs> 20 or more. Oh, wow. I hope we're as prepared as you are. These are the, these are the names that are household in our firms and, and uh, they wrote the books, right? And they've modified the books and we're modifying them again and that's all very good. They're grassroots organizations, they're government organizations, and we've even got universities that are stepping up and contributing to the, to the field that we work in. And the great news is, everybody in this room, as you well know from how tenured these folks are, um, we can all contribute, and it's our job to contribute. So keep that in mind as the years roll by, and uh, step up and be on committees, and voice your opinion, and be heard. So raise your hand if you focus primarily on commissioning for projects or new construction. It's a lot of you. Very good. I, I know there's a fifth one, right? <laughs> Pre-design. I lumped it in with design. But anyway, familiar phases of commissioning projects. Commissioning projects for all the pitfalls we've heard the past day or so, you know, we all have our... Con, there are cons with it, and there are pitfalls. But for the most part, commissioning for projects is, is pretty straightforward in that it's prescribed well. It also has engaged resources, right? Now, there's a lot of them, but they're all getting paid generally to be there, and they're all wanting to get the project done for the owner. And, there, and there's a schedule, so there's a timeline. Now, the problem is that's a pitfall because it turns into compressed schedules, right? We all know these pains. Raise your hand if you're in retro or existing building commissioning. If you do projects every day like that. Good number of you, great. So existing building commissioning, and I'm gonna borrow a phrase from Lauren Morris and Forrest Gump, and some of you may have heard it this week. Existing building commissioning is like a box of chocolates. You just don't know what's inside. So it's important that uh, most buildings are 100% occupied or or they've come through an iteration where they may be, there's a minority of the jobs that might not be occupied, but a lot of times we're dealing with existing buildings. And unlike project-based commissioning, we have some other considerations. Namely, the owner. Are they coming at this from a reactive point of view or a proactive point of view? There's legislation, things going on that's gonna push this more into proactive, which is great. Um, 
We often have scattered resources. It's the same TAB people, it's the same t uh, BAS people, but they're not always ready and engaged to go and the timeline's not set. So there's a lot of more organic uh, outline that has to be prepared and a lot of planning. And the methodologies vary, that's, that's the main thing. We have all these wonderful tools, right? There's a myriad of tools that we can use, but the methodologies vary and to get results is very challenging in some ways where the rubber meets the road. We found that utilizing these non-CAPEX measures that I'm getting ready to show you, obviously continuous commissioning is one of them, and another one that you're getting a whole lot of this week, monitoring-based commissioning, AFDD, different platforms, do great things for the owner, do great things for the team, right? It's a, it expedites, it's awesome. The last part of the industry, and this could go in different places in the presentation, but it's paramount. Setting expectations, regardless of the tools that we can get to the results that are a win for the client. <clears throat> that's, that's the real challenge. All the presentations have talked about it. We live this in our daily life, right? If you're building something at your house, you want to know what the expectation is of the contractor. You want to know what expectations are. If you're building, buying a product, everybody buys an iPhone, you know what the expectation is. It's going to work or, you know, technology, whatever it happens to be. But setting these expectations that can achieve a result is going to get the job sold. It's going to get the job done and it's going to get people happy with the results. So. Let's talk about the methodologies. It's pretty simple. We, after you engage the client and you find a project that is a good prospect, has potential, then we go through these three steps. It's pretty, it's nothing new here. Detailed assessment, implementation, ongoing and monitoring. We're gonna outline how we do these steps and uh, achieve some success. So in the detailed assessment, it is boots on the ground for a fee. We've, we've gotten, like I said, we, we've teed up a project with the owner's help and they're, they, they're bought into what's happening and they want to invest in a good, a good detailed assessment. <clears throat> we go boots on the ground, we discover operational maintenance items that need to be addressed. That's really just friction, right? You wish there were zero of those. The owner wishes there were zero of those because it really just, makes the starting point back up the schedule a little bit. We also touch a lot of the mechanical systems and the BAS, that's what it's all about. We're focused on the HVAC and the BAS and we do take the information we've learned and put it into an energy model, which is so key to how we do this. Um, without the energy model, we can't put a stake in the ground and do our ROI and payback for the owner. But, so that's where this ends. We, uh, we wrap it up in a detailed report. We come back to the owner with a proposal for implementation, simple payback, and an ROI. If all that goes well, and everybody's buying into the process, and we all believe that we're gonna achieve those, and we bank on it, energy models aren't 100% correct. Sometimes you have to go in and tweak things, but it gets you a lot closer than other, other calculations we've found and uh, it's just a really good way to handle the process. So the key to the implementation for us is the sequence of operation. That's what we're gonna focus in on. All the things we learned in the detailed assessment, we're gonna come back and we're gonna put it together in a detailed fashion. We're gonna redo the sequence of operation for today's requirements. It's gonna be detailed, it's gonna be optimized, and then we're gonna do sit down with the owner and sit down with the BAS resource and we're gonna make sure they know exactly what the scope is and that we're in budget to get it done and that there's no surprises. That, those are the makings of a great project. Hard to do sometimes, but that's the makings of a great project. Then we get into, after we start the implementation, we get into getting those programs in, doing some testing and tuning and do start with measurement and verification. And we use IP MVP option C, which Victor's gonna lead you through some of that in the case study. The other thing we weave into this is training. ACG's pounds that drum, we pound that drum, it's so key. If, if the owner doesn't 
buy into it and their staff doesn't buy into it and understand why we're doing what we're doing in the process, it's likely not going to maintain the results. And that's what gets us to the persistence phase. And we use a blend of ongoing commissioning tools such as, uh, well, monitoring base, pick a word, right? AFDD. But it's all there so that we prevent degradation in the system because things devolve over time and we maintain the efficiency gains that we set out to, to do. The other great thing about this process, and y'all likely all know this, the engagement between the owner and us is so key. And they, most of them drink, if we're this far into the process, they're drinking it up and they're like, oh, thank you. Oh, let's talk about this. Why did it do that? And it's a continuous education process where they can be proud of the facility and be proud of the measures they put in place and, and that works its way up the food chain at the, at the, at the site, you know. The, the people that approved the project and paid for the project are, are happy to see stuff like that. Three easy steps. First step takes about three months. Could take a little less, could take a little more, depends on the size and scope. Implementation is generally a year, year and a half. And then we enter the step three, the persistence. And, we do that on an annual basis. Sometimes it's a multi-annual multi -annual basis and sometimes it's just, you know, it depends on what their appetite is and how good the facility team is to take care of it moving into the future. So all that being said, and I'm about done to hand this to Victor, um, it's a proven process. We've proved it to ourselves, we've proved it to our clients, and it's a pretty exciting situation. Now this slide's really busy, but the real meat and potatoes of it is we're getting double digit savings. We're getting ROIs that are plus or minus two years. And the cost savings, they, they pile up at the bottom. We have clients that we've been doing this for over five years and that's their money. It's not somebody else's money. It's not our money. It's not another company's money that might be, be paying on the front end for it. So it's repeatable. It's predictable, and if we go through the process right, it's just a, it makes for a great, successful project. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to Victor in the case study. I'll give you the magic wand. I'm sad I don't have a harmonica. The guy that was in here yesterday did a great job, if you were in here for that. Thank you. <laughs> there you go. Thank you, Andy. Happy Friday, everyone. Good to see everyone here early. Um, I still have to get used to the mic. My wife always tells me you need to whisper because I have a very loud carrying uh, voice, so hopefully I'm not too loud now. Um, this case study is for a hospital in, in Florida, a large hospital. It was uh, occupied in 2010, about 411 uh, thousand square feet. It was renovated or it was uh, expanded in 2020 and added about 110,000 square feet to its footprint. Uh, our assessment took place in August 2013. Our implementation was done in May 2016. So in this slide, I'm gonna go first and give you the end results of what, uh, what happened through this project and then I will touch base on each step. So during the assessment, Again, keep in mind, folks, this was done 2013. The hospital was occupied in 2010. That's only three years apart. I always tell my clients, hey, an existing building is a building as soon as the owner gets occupancy. In my mind, it's existing building. That's where we can go in and start optimizing it. And this is absolutely no different. It takes this hospital about $4.14 per square foot per year to run this hospital. Its Energy Star score is six. We estimated the savings potential is about roughly about $296,000. So let's see what happens during the implementation. Implementation for the, uh, here finished in May of 2016. Now, we were able to drop their energy cost intensity. How much does it cost to run this hospital by 57 cents per square foot per year. We were able to increase their ENERGY STAR score from six all the way to 34. 
Actual savings for the first 12 months were $308,000, $309,000. So how does that look like? During the assessment, it, everything is all about the payback here. And keep, keep in mind that we don't share the savings. This is completely goes to the owner, 100%. And typically, from a cash flow positive, we're within the first six months, four to six months tops, the owner actually becomes cash flow positive. They recoup all their costs invested in this project within, typically within 1.2 1, 1 to two years or so. So as you can see here, we, we, pre we predicted a simple payback of 2.45 and an ROI of 40.84. Our project financials, as can be seen from the right side, were exceeded with a slightly shorter payback and a higher ROI. How did this, was this achieved? As Andy indicated earlier, we used the detailed assessment. We wanted to understand how the facility operates right now. Typically, I really don't care how it is designed. I care about how it is running right now. How does the owner uh, operate this building? I want to understand what are the limitations of the design, and I want to understand what is the capacity of the system to do different things. Then we want to come up with new performance measures. We want to redesign the system, so to speak, but only making the building automation system more predictable and smarter, be able to change as the load changes in the building. As part of the assessment, we, we figure out, we test every single system, point to point in every system. We command every valve, every damper. We put our eyes on it. We command it 0%, 25%, 50%, 75%, 100%. We want to make sure that whatever the control system thinks it's doing, it's actually doing in the field. And we record that. For this specific hospital, about 38% they had sensor calibration. If you're a control person, you know junk in, junk out. If the system is giving me wrong information, no matter how good the programming is, the control is going to be inaccurate, least to say. Same thing, we had some deferred maintenance, about 29% of items. And then you have sensor location, where the control vendor has actually installed sensors in the, lo in the wrong location, and nobody was the wiser, so to speak. So there were several categories of measures, and I'm going to show you what they look like. So we had measures for the boiler plant we re to reduce steam pressure. They were always running very high steam pressures when they didn't need it 24-7. Uh, we also had resets on the hot water system. On the central plant, this is a primary constant volume chill water system with a bypass valve. The bypass valve, when we were there from the beginning, it was always constantly open at 45% or more. So basically, they were putting all these chillers online and circulating the water back to them. So that, was, that indicated that there's a huge opportunity for us to have more efficient chill water bypass valve operation, few resets on the chill water, condenser water, as well as cooling tower staging, more optimized cooling tower staging. So terminal units, the same thing. We want to make sure that you know, the non-critical places, the unoccupied places, they do not need to maintain 68, 70 degrees 24-7. So that that's also was a major uh, savings for them. Air handling system, this is a very unique system. Uh, we, were, <coughs> we converted 12 units out of 24 units from constant volume boxes or air handling units into variable air volume. ASHRAE standard 17 in 2013 allows VAV systems at as long as pressure relationship is maintained and, min and minimum air rate changes, of course. However, in Florida, before March 2012, ACA required constant volume system. That is why this system in 2010 was designed as 100% constant volume. Post March 12, ACA approved variable air volume. 
However, in order to do that, we, you know, some of the things we've done is we took TAB reading before, TAB before, uh, afterwards. We also had to get ACA approval on the entire design, uh, uh, et cetera. And approval, of course, after we completed. Part of the detailed assessment is really, it's all about getting more data. I'm a data junkie. I like to have more data in order to make a better educated uh, decision on what I want to do next. I know that this is the plan. I want to be here. But how to get there, the more data you have, the more accurate you are, and the likelihood that you're going to get it. So we want to just quickly see what is their daily usage, right? Electricity usage is compared to the average outside air temperature. It's shown on this right side. Uh, and as you can see, because the, as, as expected, since this is a constant volume system, there is a high base load. So no matter what temperature changes, their daily electricity usage, as seen on the left side versus the outside air, uh, average outside air, it doesn't change a whole lot. For me, that tells me there is definite opportunity for improvement. So, so far, I haven't done anything. This is the easy portion. The next is understanding a baseline. On the left side, this is the baseline period from uh, September 2012 to September 20, uh, 2013. This, was this baseline period was used to develop a weather and day normalized energy use baseline, basically to describe the electricity use as the weather changes, outside air weather, right? In other words, the, the baseline shows how electricity would be used for a typical day at a given monthly average outside air temperature. The table above is the representation of the regression model that showcase the baseline period, that best fit the baseline period. Oops. The CVRMSE, this is the standard deviation. deviation. ASHRAE uh, guideline 14 says basically anything up to 15% is an acceptable uh, model fit of the data. So we're about 1.44 for electricity. R squared is 0.98. Typically, you need it anywhere between 0 to 1. And the closer to 1, you're, uh, this is the measure of goodness of fit of data to the model. So we're very close. That basically, that gives me the confidence that what we predicted in energy savings to the client is definitely achievable. The same scenario is done on the natural gas. This is how, how much therms per day this hospital uses as temperature, outside air temperature changes. On the left-hand side, this is, again, Similar baseline equation that represents the baseline year, where this is how much natural gas would be used daily as the temperature changes every, uh, every day. Step two, in the next few slides, we're going to discuss the result of the implementation that Andy discussed earlier. And keep in mind, it is all about the sequence of operation. It is, this is not one and done. This is, we're in the facility for a full year, folks, working side by side with facility, training them. This is not just giving them a cookbook, give it to the control vendor, hey, program this, let me know when you're done. This is working back to back with them. When it's done, we optimize the system and make sure we have fine tune it so we can get the best result for the client as weather changes, as load changes, as things changes in the hospital or the facility we're working on. These are the different measures. So from a boiler perspective, as we discussed earlier, we, we wanted to reduce, oh my gosh, my apologies. Huh. Steam reduction, reset of heat exchange and differential pressure set points. Reset is extremely important as this, this is the message throughout this week, right? Reset for differential pressure, reset for the discharge temperature, for 
um, return duct uh, humidity. So there are so many things that happen in a building, especially in a hospital, right, or, or critical environment, that there are a lot of opportunities that people miss because it's not that easy. It's easier to say, I'm gonna just run things 100% because I'm guaranteed that I'm not gonna have, have humidity issue. I'm not gonna have grills that gonna sweat, right? So what is really important is to understand the building. If you understand the building and the limitation of the design, limitation of the construction, you're able to really fine tune a measure that's really set specifically for that building, for that space that's being uh, controlled. Chiller plant we discuss again, multiple resets, staging of the uh, towers, as well as uh, the pumping system, and most importantly, the bypass valve. On the air handling systems, we have find opportunities where we can shut down some air handlers. I am yet to meet a CEO of a hospital that tells me, Victor, it's okay to shut down an air handler. Pretty much the, the conversation goes, are you nuts? You wanna shut down an air handler in a hospital? And my, my response is, absolutely. There's always opportunity. In this case, there is the loading dock uh, air handler that was running 100% 24-7. There was the cafeteria air handler that shuts down at four, five, in the, five in the afternoon. There was the cafeteria seating area that was shut down and closed, there's a rolling door. So there was so many opportunities here that there is no reason to keep the system running 24-7. So we were able to shut down specific air handling units. We were able to put a, multiple VAV boxes at un, uh, in their unoccupancy mode. In some air handler units that we did not shut, their, shut it down because we reduced the amount of need because VAV boxes went to night mode, we were able to automatically drop the amount of outside air requirement at night. And what does that look like? Remember, this is what we discussed earlier. This is the same exact graph. So the red dots are the baseline period measured utility consumption. The red line is the baseline equation or line that's represented in the equation above. The blue crosses are the actual measured consumption during the implementation phase. The difference between the blue crosses and the red line is the actual savings that we tell the client that we achieved. How is this governed? It's really governed by this formula. We pride ourselves in the fact that you do not need to have a PhD in engineering to double check what we're doing and what we're telling you. We want to make it extremely easy. When we tell you, you save $200,000, I want anybody to be able to say, yeah, it makes sense or not. And this is what governs our savings calculation. You take the average month monthly temperature, you plug it into this formula, it spits out a number. That number is what, you, what the owner would have, had con would have consumed in terms of KWH, should he have not decided to go through this retro commissioning effort. The difference between what he would have used versus what he actually used is the savings. Same exact thing for natural gas. The blue crosses is the actual measured terms from the, taken out directly from the utility bills. The red dots are the measured values, values through the baseline period. Similar scenario, you plug in the temperature in this formula, it gets you those numbers. But to make life easier, we will show you a bunch of different ways right now that we present the data. This is roughly about $1.4 million cumulative savings through October 2021. Remember the results at the beginning. We exceeded our financial prediction. We shortened the simple payback, and we also increased our ROI on this project than what we originally predicted. A lot of people look at data differently. 
And that is why in our reporting for energy savings as part of our measurement and verification, we want to show the clients all different ways to look at the data because somebody may want to see it this way. Somebody, the CFO wants, is only interested in certain things. So it's key to have so many ways to represent what you've done so you can take care of everybody's need in a single report. So this is one of them. This is a table that shows you the combined electricity and natural gas, gas monthly savings. It shows you how much each month, prorated this is to the month, and how much for electricity, for natural gas, and here is the total. Here is the tol total yearly savings for that year. Easy peasy. Now, this, remember the two formulas we were discussing and we spent time on it? This is, where, this is what this is. If you take the formula for, for electricity, I have fat finger uh, syndrome, sorry guys. So if you take this average temperature, that's 60 for instance, you plug it into the formula that we showed you, it will show you that, hey, your baseline consumption based on today's, or basically the month in question, the month of implementation, you would have consumed 1.2 million kWh. However, your measured data from your January bill says you only consume 1.1. The difference is 1.39. Now, being an engineer and a data junkie, if I have it my way, I would never ever associate dollar to a consumption because like as someone said brilliantly, said that uh, yesterday in one of the sessions I attended. You can only change consumption, affect consumption energy and energy uh, um, conservation measures. What you cannot really affect is dollar. If the owner have um, uh, negotiated a better uh, dollar per term, then obviously the savings gonna drop. If taxes went up, obviously the savings going to go up. So it, could go, it can go both ways, for, uh, for you or against you. So for me, what I hang my hat on is this column. This is my favorite column. The KWH difference in consumption. That is what the project did. That is solid. That cannot be changed. Meaning, this is not uh, a fictitious number. This has nothing to do with uh, taxes, this has nothing to do with anything else. This is pure consumption. What that relates to is 11%. At this is, as you can see, the dollar per kWh. As you can see, month to month, it changes. This is the month, the implementation month in question that we are processing the savings for. That's what we use multiplied by this number to get the savings number. Again, the idea is to be an open book. We want to make it extremely easy for anybody to double check what we're doing and most importantly, what are we uh, reporting. So you have the formula, you have these numbers, easy to double check. Well, folks, the exact same thing is done on the natural gas. Average monthly temperature, this is the baseline consumption. Again, baseline consumption is coming out of the regression baseline model that tells us here is what the owner would have consumed should he not, he or she, sorry, have not gone through this retro commissioning process. The actual consumption, this is, comes directly from the utility bill for natural gas. The difference is the savings. Another way to present it here. So this, is a, this bar chart represents the monthly cost savings, month over month. If you remember, what did, they do, what did this hospital do? They expanded in 2020. They added 111 thousand square feet to their footprint and you can see it the beauty about what we do is because we don't share with the savings the owner 
owns the equipment, owns their destiny. They can do whatever they want. What our job is to say, hey, you decided to run this chiller, to, this air handler 24 seven, no problem. Our job is to say, well, here is, you made a decision, here is the cost to your decision. Why, why is it important to me to tell him that? Not to justify a number, it's because in the future, when, for instance, if it's a corporate that a certain time of the year they fly everybody nationwide and they have meetings and they want everything 24 seven running, now they can budget for this kind of decision. They say, huh, in 2020, we lost about, we added about $17,000 extra in utility because we hosted this event. So in the future, my facility team, when they go back and, and set up their, uh, um, what's called, their budget, and they realize that they're gonna have to do this one more time, now they can be ve uh, able to justify the addition to their budget. Because a lot of times, when you go through retro commissioning process, obviously, the, since they're already achieving that much saving, $300,000 saving a year, their budget is most probably dropping by a certain amount as well. So to justify getting more money, we use these kind of reporting. A lot of the savings that my clients use, they end up reinvesting it in the hospital, buying whether it's investing in a new air handler or fixing things, etc. Again, this is different way to present the data. The data. It's, all, it's all about who's gonna read the report and what they're interested in. This bar chart representation of the monthly energy savings as a percentage. And here is something that's really important to all of us, especially now it's coming to the, uh, to the forefront of every, every CEO, every company, every green company right now, right? It is the greenhouse gas emissions. In this facility, we were able to avoid almost 13,000 metric ton of CO2 equivalent. Well, for the normal person, well, I don't know what that means, right? Okay, well, what does that mean? In layman terms, here's what that means. You're talking about almost 2,700 less cars on the road for a year. Imagine the emissions from 2,700 cars running on the, on, on the highway for a year have been taken off with this or offset those emissions. You're talking about almost 1,160 homes being off the grid for one year. What does that equal to as well? It's equal to 68 less rail cars of coal going to the power plant. So when you talk about metric tons of CO2 equivalent and avoidance, this is what you're really doing. It's not a pie in the sky. This, it actually relates to something different. And for me, that's what's important. It's when you relate those engineering terms to something that the average person can understand, you tend to, to get an appreciation of what's happening. A lot of my clients use this in the town hall meetings, especially uh, hospitals. They put it on their, uh, um, on their uh, dashboards. It's to showcase their patients and their clients to say, we've been very conservative with our money. A lot, of then, a lot of people equate green. When you say a building is lead, you immediately think it's healthy. You immediately think, oh, it's, it's great. If a facility you're paying uh, money for, such as healthcare, and you think it's lead, you immediately also think, huh, healthcare, not just it's probably priced correctly, but it's gonna be safe for me to be there. So there are a lot of, lot of soft, uh, impact out of this kind of project that uh, your uh, that clients can t get from on garnish. The last phase is really this is where we are right now with this client. We've been for many years with this client is the monitoring based commissioning process. The process is the monitoring based. What we, the tool we use is the AFDD, automatic fault detection diagnostic software, which is really is the theme of this conference. Almost every session I've been had the mentioning of AFDD. And we are no exception. It's extremely important. Again, it's all about data. In the past, when I used to, when I used to be with the Siemens and a control vendor, when an engineer 
asked me for, for trends, and if he wasn't playing a team member, it's like, yeah, no problem, man. I'll bury you with trends. I will give him thousands of trends that he can't even go through it. Because in the old way, how did we used to do it? Excel. Right now, we have AFDD that does this way much better. It allows us to, instead of shotgun approach, we really pinpoint focus on, need a focus on what we need to do and how we need to do it, and if the data telling us a true story or not. Much faster, much more efficient. So you guys already know what monitoring-based commissioning, ongoing commissioning, it's been through all these sessions. Again, it's all about making augment comfort. Uh, all the time, this is cloud-based software, the AFTD that's being used. So it's not sitting on IT network, though in some cases, as others have shown, you could have a third-party controller that can be put on, on top of the building automation control so you can get via BACnet or whatever uh, protocol, you're able to read what's happening in the system and make a decision. I just discussed this. It's all of the AFDD is all about setting up the sophisticated rules. I, it's really software as a professional service. Why? Just because you can, as the owner, can go and buy a software, say, oh, well, I can buy the AFDD software, and I can uh, just subscribe to it. It doesn't mean it's set up correctly. The AFDD usage is as good as the person who set it up, that's one. Two, it's as good as the professional sitting behind the computer that's analyzing all the issues that are being reported by the AFDD. So it's extremely important to have the right person set it up and the right person driving. Again, I truly believe in always having the right person on the right bus, on the right seat to do, the, uh, to do any kind of commissioning. You don't want somebody who is jack of all trades because all you're gonna get is somebody that has knowledge about a lot of things. What you need is an SME. You need a subject matter expert that only focuses on one thing, a control, mechanical, plumbing, electrical, because otherwise, you're not gonna get the best value out of your retro commissioning engineer or company. We, again, the intention of this, we wanna find out system-wide issues before they become problems. It's extremely cost-effective method, in my opinion, for reducing troubleshooting and investigative maintenance activities. I like to call it as really as a performance, performance warranty of a source, right? It's the least amount of money you can pay or invest in your building to know so much that's happening. Imagine if this is a new construction, you're in the warranty period, and you have AFDD deployed correctly. It's pretty much, I tell my uh, client, this allows you for really free maintenance for a year. If the building you I just occupied have issues, whether it's design, whether it's control, whether whatever it is, or equipment that malfunctioning. If this guy can tell me, all I'm doing is passing this back to the construction team, say, hey, fix this, hey, fix this. That means my FTEs are not running around fixing things that should be under warranty. And most important, my FTEs are not having to deal with things that only got discovered past the warranty period. So. AFDD can be really best used also from a GC perspective, general contractor. The general contractor doesn't want to be called back over and over to fix things, right? So if he can figure out what's working what's not, and what's not and be able to get his subs to do it right, it's win-win for everybody. So I'm an extreme proponent of AFDD. Finally, again, Using an AFDD for the long term, it really allows for continued performance improvement over time. Speaking of time, how are we doing on time? We have about 15 minutes. Beautiful. All right. Quick examples here. Through, the, through our analytics, we're able to see, for instance, this box. As you can see, it's really hunting. Typically, when I used to be with Siemens, the first thing when they tell me a valve stopped working, 
my go-to approach is not to jump to the roof and go check the valve and replace it. My go-to approach is really run this. Look at the trends. And if I see those valves are really stroking like crazy, I give them a copy of my submetal that says, hey, these are uh, um, have a specific number of strokes for per lifetime. You're exceeding that. You're damaging. You are the one who's damaging the, the, the valve or the actuator rather than the, the equipment is malfunctioning. It's malfunctioning because of how you're treating it. Here is what it was. Look at the huge difference. This is a VAV box, folks. The VAV box or the terminal unit is the smallest thing. I always called my VAV boxes are the perfect children and air handlers are the parents. VAV boxes only speak when spoken to, to an extent, right? So if most of your children are misbehaving like this, can you imagine the energy cost impact? Can you imagine how that affects your uh, hot water system, your, uh, your chill water system, your static pressure system, and resets? Forget that. This is where it is afterwards. This is what you want your PID loop to need. Most control vendors, they write the program, they put certain values for their uh, PID loop, and they call it a day. They say, huh? It's going in the right direction, it's opening or closing, it looks good enough, eventually I meet set point. For me, when I'm doing retro commissioning, I have a rule. If I'm in a, <coughs> pardon me, if I'm in a critical environment, I want to come to a steady state on any PID loop within three minutes. If I'm in a non-critical area, I want to come to a steady state within five minutes is acceptable. Well, what does that mean, coming to a steady state? That means if my, dis my air handler discharge set point was set to 55 and somebody decided to change it to 57, I allow a maximum of three minutes if it's critical or five minutes before I have a very nice sinusoidal wave that actually represent how fast I come to a steady state and meet my set point. A lot of times this is something that gets missed, unfortunately. In this example, air handler unit static pressure, as can be seen here, is not being met while the VFD is 100%. Basically, the control vendor is doing everything he's supposed to do. It says, I can't mean static. I opened my, uh, I drove my fan to 100%. I can't do anything more for you, client. Sorry. Go talk to your engineer. Same thing here. We cannot maintain on a VAV box, space temperature is not met while the valve is 100% open. Again, the control vendor would say, Victor, my, my control system is working exactly what it's supposed to do. It's fine-tuned. It's trying its best to maintain. It cannot maintain it. That's what the AFDD helps us as part of our mounting-based commissioning service. It helps us to come back and say, OK, well, what is it? Is it an issue at the parent, at the air handler level, if it's a static issue? Or is it maybe the strainer is clogged? Maybe, uh, <coughs> some, something, maybe it doesn't have enough flow to the core. There's so many issues. So in our reports to the client, we always give them a whole list of things that they can do, or we suggest that they check before they uh, go in the field to make sure they understand what's going on, what's the root cause of the problem. That's the other thing that's really important is a lot of facility because I get the pleasure of working in existing building. You get anecdotal uh, stories of how the system works. And a lot of times, they, over the years, they have put so many band-aids on a system that those band-aids become what? The permanent solution. This is how my building works. This is how it should work. You cannot change it. It will fail. Well, when you start tripping out the band-aid and figure out the root cause of the problem, that's when, you, that's when you start optimizing. Uh, here is chiller staging. Chillers are one of the most intensive energy usage equi using equipment in a facility, which all of you probably already know. Uh, so I'm preaching to the choir. 
the ability within an AFDD system is that you can create your own virtual points through the trends that you receive. So in this case, for instance, I always keep track of the number of online chillers, number of online pumps, whether it's condenser, chill water, cooling towers, etc. This allows me very easy, instead of muddy the water and look at so many different things and map all five chillers or whatever number of chillers in the central plant and see which one is on, look at Renlow Dam, very easily. One point, I look at it and say, huh, I want two chillers, drop to one chiller, then one up to two chillers, then one up to three. That's definitely not a right control. We're staging too fast, and most probably we're dropping too fast. This is something that we can, when we look at it, that's, that's a huge cost impact and comfort impact that we can fix. Uh, back to the original. Prior to EBX, right, they were running at $4.4 per square foot per year, and energy start of six. The peak of uh, Energy Star was 35, was obtained in July 2016. In October, they were at 23. Keep in mind that in 2020, they added 114,000 square feet of hospital space, critical space. Nevertheless, even with the added, sorry, with the added of 100, 110,000, they were still running at 3.47. That's 57 cents per square foot per dollar cheaper than when they first started, even though they added almost 30% more uh, footprint to their building. This is huge. At least, I think so. Uh, <laughs> this project well, actually received the Ashi Energy to Care Award. Uh, the award recipient is all about basically uh, reducing their consumption by 10% in a single year. And that's what the client has. So basically it shows that the decision they made to invest in the retro commissioning process was absolutely worthwhile. And it's still till now worthwhile. With this, I end the presentation. I open the floor for and invite you for questions. Now you're challenging my abilities. <laughs> okay, so you have a slide buried in there that has 16 energy measures in it. It's quite a ways back. My question is, and I've got a couple questions regarding this slide. So on that slide where you've got that one right there, so it ends at 16. Do you have the amount of energy savings per measure broken out anywhere? Do you have a rough idea of how much these save? Excellent question, and the answer to, uh, to your question is no, because we are using, as Andy indicated earlier, we are using IP MVP option C, whole building simulation. So therefore, we use the utility bills, and we do not look at measure by measure. OK. Does that make sense? It does make sense. And so buried in here, you've got energy measure 10. I mean, that's a major renovation project. So I absolutely believe your savings. I mean, they are, they are huge. I've seen that with projects. So it seems like you've got 15 recommissioning measures and then a big, giant construction project in there. And so how I interpret that is you're saving about $280,000 annually, and then if they cost recovered in six months, that's a project cost of about $60,000 if they cost recovered in six months. So how are you able to implement measure 10 by replacing air handlers and going from a constant volume system to a variable air volume system for so, under $60,000? I mean, how does that math, or do they just cost recover your cost? So, quick answer, but before that. Yeah. One, you know the difference between a good question and brilliant question? A good question is a question that I actually have an answer to. A brilliant question is I have a slide for. I do have a slide in a, okay. in a, at the bottom of the presentation. But to let you know, you know what's the renovation cost for this? 12 return dampers were installed, and that is it. OK, that answers the, my question. The Excellent. simple payback and ROI is based on my fee the control vendor fee, the mechanical fee, the engineering fee, all rolled 
together including the assessment. So not just implementation fee, the assessment plus implementation, but ev and everybody else. Because the system already had all the widgets. The only thing we had to do is install return air dampers. That's cheap. So the, v the VFDs were there on the air handlers? They had Everything is oh, there. Yeah. Then you're good. Yep, I believe it. I mean, exactly. The renovation was nothing. And I, and I lived this project from beginning to the end, too. Thank you. I, I should, right? <laughs> Remind me. <laughs> okay, any more questions? Go ahead. Uh, regrettably, it was commissioned. Absolutely, it went through a full new construction commissioning. But keep in mind, for a new construction commissioning, the job of the commissioning agent is not to change sequence of operation. It's not to optimize sequence of operation. Their job is simply to make sure it is designed based on the engineer of record requirement. As we all know, design engineers, they might be phenomenal designers, but they know jack about controls. They don't teach controls in school. So they tend to say what? I will let the control vendors, uh, they're the expert. They know how I want to control it. Well, do they? They don't have the best uh, client interest at heart. Please go ahead. Just a quick question. So what's happened since? Um, it's static. The Energy Star score could be doubled again, could go to 75. Have they continued to, I mean, it's static from 2016 from your results. Have they retained you to continue making improvements or has it just been static over the last five years? So, great question. At a point in time, they stopped the monitoring-based commissioning. And then they came back after they start losing more energy to it. But having said that, typically, keep in mind, this has zero widget replacement. We did not put more efficient motors. We did not replace chillers. We did not change the piping from a primary constant volume chiller to a variable uh, or VPF, right? So once you optimize it fully, there's not a, to go further, it's going to be extremely small incremental change. So I don't expect it to go very high in terms of savings going forward, especially with all the added, just maintaining it and every now and then having small incremental change. Once, and then, who's, who's next? Okay. <clears throat> once, a lot of clients, once they see savings, it's very hard, they're, they're very hard pressed to spend more money to get more savings. They figure, well, we already saved pretty considerable. Until they go through a certain time, certain hump, say, okay, well, I think we're ready. Um, so basically, this project was rather new, I mean 2016. How about if you're doing a retro commissioning for a 20, 25 year old building, how do you set your fees? I mean, you can get yourself into so much, you know, hours and research and, you know, you might not have all the documentation that you might have had on this uh, 2016 building. The majority of my projects are hospital that are 30, 40, 50 years old that they don't, and especially government hospitals, that they have no clue what they have. So it's exactly the same thing. I, the assessment is what's important for me. This is what I make all my decisions. Going there, understanding the systems. The only thing the drawings will give me is getting the data out of the air handlers, understanding what their capacity. But typically, if you're in an assessment form, and your boots on the ground, you're able to take all these nameplate data and gather a lot of that information. At the end of the day, that's all I need. Because I'm in the space, looking at the air handler, look at the installation, look at the, the central plan, how it's installed, how it's running. And keep in mind, all our decisions are based on how it runs now, rather than how it was designed 20, 30 years ago. So it's, from a cost perspective, honestly, I don't see, the, I, for me, it didn't make a whole lot of difference at all. I'm still spending a week or two on site, whether it's a 30-year-old hospital or, uh, or 
one year hospital. It really depends on how big it is and how um, sophisticated the equipment is. Do we have more time for questions? We do. Uh, for an existing facility where you don't have any written sequences of operation from design or, or specifications or submittals, what is your process for assessing how things are running when you start that assessment? Thank you for that question. Brilliant. One of the core deliverables in my assessment is giving the client an SOP that tells you, here is how your system's actually running right now. How do we do that? Again, I kind of barely touched on this when I said people give me anecdotal uh, stories of how the system works, which is great, thank you, but that's not what I care for. What I care for is how it's programmed. Usually we sit with the control vendor or on our own and look at every single program and based on the program, we decide, huh, this is what makes the system tick. This is how the chill water is, uh, is modulating. This is how the, the outside air damper or economizer is working. So we write in layman terms a whole sequence of operation that says, hey, based on the building automation system programming, here is how your building being controlled. I do that in a single color, let's say black. I actually, I do it first. I do, if I have drawings, I say, here is what the design engineer wants it. Here is how it's running. And then right below it in a different color saying, here is my optimization because I want to always keep track of every step so people can see what it was and what it is in one single document. So thank you, that's a great question. We have time for a couple more questions. And if you have an, another question, uh, please raise your hand. So for uh, this project, it kind of sounds like the building engineer went in after the commissioning was done and adjusted set points and messed with all sorts of stuff. With your software or within the process, how do you prevent people from playing with it? So, I don't believe in locking out the client out of their own system. I am completely against that. I am all for training. I, I, in fact, one of the things I do in this implementation, I put so many points on the graphics, on special graphics, because I want my clients to be able to change anything they want within the system without having to pay $1,000 per trip for a control vendor to come in and change a set point through programming. Having said that, you can set limits. And so I put certain program parameters under certain graphics that only certain people have access to. But I want everybody to see everything. And as being in the facility for a full year, we're working side by side with a facility and operation group. So we're doing a lot of training. In fact, part of my training when I do it is I go into the system and do something wrong and say, you know, figure out what I've done wrong. What is it supposed to do? Why is it not working? To train them so that they do not start commanding the wrong set point in order to, do something, to achieve a result. Does that answer your question? Yeah. You, you, I mean, it's their own system. It's all about training at the end of the day because you know what? If they don't buy in, into the process, they're always going to go and do, and their job is to do whatever it takes to fix the system, right? So our job is to train them how to fix the system with minimal damage to its integrity. And we will figure out, we always track all these set points. So we tell them, when we, when we see something is wrong through the trends, we also report to them and tell them, hey, did you mean to command this? It's been an operator for the past you know, 10 days. Do we have time for one more question? One more. <laughs> so it, it, it's, it depends. If they are pneumatic, if they are electrically controlled and pneumatically actuated, I me meaning it has uh, I2P, then it's no different than anything else. The only difference is my sequence of operation will not be as sophisticated as I would like it to be. 
it's going to be limited. Remember, we do not change the control system itself. We change the programming. So if the control system is only able to accommodate certain things, then all it does, it restricts my imagination on how I want to control it and uh, how to achieve that result. Okay, thank you both so much. Great presentation. Thank you. Appreciate you all.